morning. Glad that you're watching at home as well. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let me give you a couple of words of announcement this morning. Uh, we are going to be doing trunk or treat this year. We're going to try to be careful. We're not going to go into the gym and so forth. But we are going to be doing trunk or treat on the 31st, which is a Sunday this year. So we'll be doing it that Sunday night from 5 to 7. So we need a couple of things. We need about 20 cars decorated. So if you would be willing to decorate your car and hand out candy, let me know, okay? Or call the church office and let Bailey know. And uh, so don't think somebody else will do it. Uh, you do it. And uh, let's make sure that we've got plenty uh, of cars that we can hand it out. And the other thing we need is candy. A lot of candy. We will hand out a ton of candy. A lot of our neighborhood comes through here. Reasons. This is one of the opportunities that we have to really minister to our neighborhood because they're the ones who come, and it lets them just be at our church. So again, that'll be on the 31st. Um, also, ladies, uh, if you haven't been aware, you can see it in your bulletin. The ladies, you're having a brunch on Saturday. Uh, at 10 o'clock uh, Saturday morning. That's going to be in the fellowship hall. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you can scan that code that is there in the bulletin or just call the church office and let us know. But we uh, want to encourage you to be a part of that. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, and, Pastor, uh, did you forget? Pardon? Did you forget? I'm sure I did. <laughs> I can't believe you forgot. <laughs> How long have you known me? Um, since 1838. 18... <laughs> No, really, how, how, long, how long have we known each other? 2002. Since 2002. Of September 2002, right? Yes. <laughs> You've been here that long? I have been here that long. You've been here longer. <laughs> I'm going to ask Kim Smith to come up with a personnel committee. I mean, we only do a presentation. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Grady. This is why you've been nice to me today. Exactly. Okay. I even set up here in the front and everything for you today. <laughs> Well, um, I'm here on behalf of the Personnel Committee. For those of you that might be new, uh, Brother Ken has been with us 19 years as of last week, mm. I believe, even though his memory's bad. Uh, he's older than me, so I've still got a little bit more of mine. But uh, we do want to show a little bit of appreciation, uh, give him a pat a little something. Thank you, Brother Ken. And uh, Brother Ken has been awesome, uh, been a great mentor in my life, even called me out at work twice since he's been here and he doesn't know how much I appreciate that. I know it was hard for him, but, but it really touched me that he loved me that much that he would call me out on it. So that's just the kind of pastor he is. He has really shepherded his sheep well and I hope he'll be here another 19, 20 or however many years that we're able to be blessed with him and Pat. But thank you and Pat for what you do. We love you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Pat. Thank you. Let's pray together. Father God, we do thank you for those who serve us. Uh, Lord, those who take care of us and those who love us. And Lord, we just thank you that you've put love in Brother Ken's heart to love us. And Lord, we pray that today we would sense the love you have for us. Lord, that we would do nothing else but know that you love us so much that you were willing to give yourself on a cross to pay our penalty. And so, Lord, today as we come, I pray that we would understand that and our, the worship that we sing would come from the bottom of our hearts in appreciation for what you've done for us. We pray that these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us as we sing this morning? I was I'm in the wrong key. <laughs> Sorry about that. You were supposed to remind me about that. <laughs> he was supposed to run. I was buried beneath my shame.
come before you just realizing that you are the one who provides the way who does everything for us that we can imagine Lord you provide the things that we need in our lives you work in our lives to accomplish the things that you need to see done on this earth and Lord so many times we don't listen and we don't obey but Lord you're still the one who's going to help us to get through those times to use us to work in us and make a way Lord you made a way for us when Christ died on the cross for us but Lord we are here today with praise because he didn't he went into the grave but he didn't stay he's alive today and reigns and lives in each and one of us so, Lord, we praise you for that today. May we give you glory and praise because you so richly deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all remain standing.
thank you for everything that you've done for us today, all that you're going to do throughout the rest of this service, and uh, just the things that you'll do in us through this week as we go out into our community um, and just serve you. And God, uh, just pray as uh, Pastor Ken comes up and delivers your word um, that you would speak through him. In your name pray, amen. Let me say, just before I get started here, you can go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 3. That's our text this morning. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 19 as best we can. There's so much here that I can't really cover as much as I would like. But just let me say, this has been, for me and my family, a great 19 years. And one thing I tell a lot of other preachers that I run into, one of the things that I never question since I've been here since 2002 is whether my church loves me or not. There's no doubt in my mind that you love me, and, and uh, it, it, it is just wonderful. You are wonderful people to pastor, and uh, just so many of you are my friends, and so it's been a great experience for me as well. Folks, in the beginning, God created, and it says it was good. In fact, as each day closes, it says that each time, all five days at first, and it was good. And after the sixth day, when man is created, the epitome of all that God was going to create, the apex of it, he said, and it was very good. That means it was perfect. Humanity lived in perfection on this earth and with God. There were no defects. There were no flaws. There were no struggles. There was not any discord or hatred. It was perfect. But it didn't stay that way very long, did it? I mean, all it takes is by the time we get to chapter 3, and it doesn't tell us how long that is, but by the time we get to chapter 3, man already tries to usurp God's authority, takes matters into his own hands, and he sins. And it was not good. Because brokenness now entered into the world, and the downward spiral begins, and it changes the world forever. There's a lot in chapter 3. And again, we're not going to have time to get into all of it. I'll try to do the best I can. But if you don't mind, would you stand as I read verses 1 through 19? Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, And pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave it to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Is that not a cool picture? This, uh, to me, this is probably a, a manifestation of God. It's probably Jesus. And it's like every day he just kind of came down in the cool of the evening and he walked with them. How cool would that have been? But they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called a man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? You've eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she's the reason. She gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, 
Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through the painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Father, please open our hearts and our minds to hear what you have to say to us. Lord, we're getting into your word, so you're going to be speaking. And I pray, Lord, that I could be your mouthpiece today. But Lord, you don't need the words that I'm saying to speak to people. You can put a still small thought within their mind, and I pray that you would do whatever you need to to get through to each one of us. God, we are not here by chance today. We are here because you want to speak to us. So Lord, let us listen to your word and then apply it into our life. God, would you change our lives today as we get into your word? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So the serpent is taken over by Satan himself. He fills this snake, and he begins to speak to the woman. Now, there is conjecture of whether Adam was there with her or not. Now, we don't know for certain, but I think a couple of things point to most likely he was there. The reason I say that is, is because as the serpent speaks, he constantly uses the plural of you. So it's the second uh, part of, of you. It's not singular, but plural. So Adam may have been there. And and I also think that he was there and did nothing to stop it because when you get into 1 Timothy 2.14, Paul states there it was the Eve that was deceived by Satan, but Adam was not deceived. And I've always heard that to to mean that she was the one that blew it and just kind of led him into it. I think what it means is he was there. He wasn't deceived by it. He knew that it was wrong and he did it anyway. So Satan fills this serpent, and it says that he is crafty. He's sharp. Folks, he knows how to craft a story, and he knows how to make it sound good, and that's exactly what he does. And he crafts his words, first of all, to bring doubt into their minds about who God is, and he does this in four ways. In verse 1, he has them question God himself. He said, did God really say? Have you ever said that? Did did God really say that? I I really believe that's one of the things that we really struggle with today is is that we do question God's Word a lot of times. We we read it and we look at it and we say, well, is that what it really means? Is that really what God wanted to say through that? And we begin to distort it in different ways. He gets us to question God in His Word. He gets us to question God's motives. How many times have you asked God why? I know some of you don't. I do at times, but it's questioning God's motives. Do you really know what you're doing, God? Why did you do this? He also gets us to question God's character a lot of times. We question things like, you know, God, if you really love me, then this would not have happened in my life. So Satan gets us to question God in many ways. Are you questioning God? Secondly, he then distorts God's Word. Now, notice what he said. He said, did he really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Somebody help me out. Did God say that? No. No. It's a distortion of God's Word. God just gave one condition. He said, there's one tree you cannot eat from. And Satan really expands it. He tries to get it sound much worse. Did God really say you can't eat any of the fruit from any of those trees? He distorts what God had said. And then sadly, Eve follows suit because she distorts God's Word as well. Did you notice what she added? God had told her that you cannot eat from that tree, and she says, and you cannot touch it. So she's already beginning to be taken in by Satan, and she's beginning to distort God's Word as well. Satan distorts his Word. Thirdly, he begins then to substitute his own lies in verse 4 and 5. Again, he's very crafty here. 
because all that he states has a little truth to it, but he's attempting, and this is what he's really trying to do. He's trying to get them to the point where they believe that God is holding out on them, that God isn't being completely forthright with them. He's not being completely honest, and God is holding something back, something better for them that they cannot have. And you know what, as I was thinking about it, isn't that really why we sin? Even though most of the time we really do know right from wrong, and even though we know what God says most of the time, we sin, and this is why, because we think it's better for us. We sin because we believe it's better. Sin gives us more pleasure. Sin gives us more power. Sin gives us more popularity. We sin because we sense God is holding out on us. And and if we were to be really honest, for a moment, it just may be. But we need to understand as it never lasts. There are always consequences to going against God's rule and reign. When we sin, there is a consequence every time. Then we learn that God's not holding out on us. What he's doing is he's holding us back from experiencing more brokenness in our lives. Now, I want you to notice the devil's half-truths here. First of all, he says, you will not die. Now, folks, that's a half-truth. There is some truth to that. They didn't die right away, did they? Physically speaking, anyway. But you know what? It did bring death immediately. You know what died? their relationship with God. I talked about how God would show up and walk with them in the garden in the cool of the day. That wasn't going to happen anymore. In fact, God is going to expel them from his garden, and the Garden of Eden symbolized the very presence of God. They were no longer going to be in the presence of God. They could not walk with him that way anymore. There was separation that took place. A death did occur immediately, but there's a half-truth to it. They didn't die physically immediately, although it did come. Secondly, he said, your eyes will be opened. Were their eyes open, yes or no? Absolutely. They did begin to see. But what did they see? They saw their nakedness. And for the first time in their lives, they felt things they'd never felt before. Shame, embarrassment, guilt. They began to see just how different they were. They began to see flaws in each other. They began to see flaws in themselves. You see, as their eyes were opened, they sensed their isolation, their aloneness, and fear. They had never had these destructive emotions before. Now they were there, so their eyes really were opened. Listen, when Satan tempts you with sin, he's only going to reveal half of the truth of what he's trying to tell you. He will craft it in such a way that you will only see the pleasure in the sin. But there is always the other half. There's always the other part that's going to bring destruction, separation, isolation, shame, and consequences, and eventually death. Death of a dream. The death of your conscience. The death of a relationship. The death of your reputation. Make sure that when you're thinking about plunging into that sin that he has crafted that you really love to do, realize there's two halves to the truth here that may bring pleasure for a moment, but it'll never last, and there will be consequences to it. The other thing that he said was this, the truth, you will know good from evil. Yes, they did. From that moment on, they not only knew good, but now they know evil as well. They had never known evil before. It had never crossed their mind. Nothing bad had ever happened. And now they would struggle with evil the rest of their lives and mankind as well for the rest of time. They would see evil very quickly as well. By the next chapter, one of their sons murders the other one. Evil becomes prevalent very quickly. It didn't touch them before. They didn't ever experience wrong before, but now they were. Church, please understand, Satan is very crafty. And to me, the whole key to this is this. Listen, don't start listening to him at all. Don't start listening. 
If you begin to listen to him, he will deceive you and he will convince you that what you need to do is to go into that sin. So the best thing to do is not listen to him at all. You know, I can't help but think about this story. And, and what if Eve would have just walked away? Or what if Adam would have just grabbed her hand and said, we're out of here? Or what if they would have just called out to their heavenly father for him to come help them? They wouldn't have failed and fallen at that time. But they listened. Soon as you begin to listen to him, you're going to fall. The best thing to do when Satan comes at you with anything, whatever that sin may be in your life, run. Run away and run to your father. That's the best thing to do. Second thing I want you to know is this. Notice the temptation that he puts before him. This is how Satan tempts him. Look at verse 6 again. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. First of all, we see here the sin of the flesh. The fruit, they said, was good for food. She had pleasure from this fruit. It pleased her flesh. Secondly, we see the lust of the eyes. It was pleasing to their eyes. It looked so good. They wanted it so badly. She just had to have it. And then she said, he said, it was desirable for gaining wisdom. That's called the pride of life. She wanted more. She was not content with what she had. 1 John tells us the same sins. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, he says this, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world. Now listen to the temptations here, the sins, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. These are the same three temptations that Satan works in us and comes against us with as well. He knows those are the three areas that we are weakest in. We sins of the flesh, sins of the eye, and the pride of life, wanting more than we should have. But there's one other temptation that he throws out before him. And I think this is the biggest temptation. In verse 5, he said, got to get back to Genesis. In verse 5, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Deep down, that really is what we want. We want to be our own God. We want to be the decision maker in our life. We want to determine what is best for us. We want to be the one in charge. We want to sin when we want to sin and how we want to sin. We want control over the heart of our life and over our life. Isn't that the sin that Satan had? He was kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be God. He wanted to sit on his throne. And we still do the same things today. But folks, listen to me. Did you realize we were not created to be God? We are usurping the authority, the order of things. He is God and we aren't. We were not created to run our own lives, but to receive our life from our relationship with God. But when we take over, we foul it all up. When we take over, we mess it up. And not just in our lives, but in the lives of those who love us as well. A simple truth. Let God be God and you be you. Don't try to be God. You are not created to be God. He is God. The third thing I want you to notice is what sin does, what it brings. Number one in verse 7 it brings a cover-up. What did they immediately try to do once they realized that they were naked? They sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And that's what we do as well. When we sin, we immediately begin to cover it over. We attempt to make sure that no one else knows it. We attempt to hide it from God just like they did. Listen to me. When God said, came in and said, where are you? Did God know where they were? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, What is it that you have done? He already knew. He saw them do everything. He's trying to build the relationship again already. 
but he sees we cannot hide our sin from God, but we try to. And we try to justify it, and we try to excuse it. You remember the Watergate trial, for those of you who are old enough, back in, still living in the 70s? Back then, you remember what President Nixon really got in trouble for? It was the cover-up. It wasn't necessarily that they did what they did. It was the cover-up that really got to him. And that's what gets us as well, the cover-up, trying to cover our sin up. Secondly, we hide our sin. They immediately hid from God, thinking that they could hide it from Him, and they couldn't. And for the first time in their life, they felt shame and guilt and fear. And it led them to try to hide what they had done. They thought that they could keep it from God. And again, we try to still do that today. And not just from God. I think we try to do it from each other as well. Especially church people. When we come here, we dress nicely and we want to look the part. And we don't want anyone to think there is something wrong in our life, something deceitful, something wrong, some sin in our life. But listen to me, every one of us does. We all sin. Why do we try to hide it from each other? We all realize that we all sin and we cannot hide it, but we try anyway. But you know what hiding our sin does? It just brings greater shame. It brings greater guilt. It brings greater isolation. And eventually what hiding our sin does is it stops intimacy between us and God and it prevents intimacy between us as people of God as well. The best thing to do when we sin is not hide it. It's immediately confess it to God, but also have those people in your life that you can go to and confess it to as well, saying, this is where I'm struggling. Would you pray for me? And again, we don't have to do that in front of the church unless God asks you to do that, but we do need those people in our life that we can go to and we can confess it. Quit hiding your sin. And the third thing that happened because of their sin the blaming began. Now, who did Adam blame for what happened? Eve. Right away, he blames Eve. Now, remember when she was first created, man, he was wowed by her. He was amazed. He was mesmerized and so appreciated that he now had this helpmate, one to come alongside of him. But now he's saying, she's the one who gave me the fruit. It's her fault. In other words, there's now a distrust and a distance between them that was not there before. There's a separation. They begin to find faults with one another. It's not his fault, it's hers. But he blames somebody else, doesn't he? He blames God. The woman you gave me. Now, I don't know if he emphasized it like that or not, but he's pointing his finger in God and said, God, I'm not the one to blame here. You're the one who created her. If you wouldn't have put her with me, this would have never happened. I'd have never done that on my own. He begins to blame God. God's the one that messed up. Don't we love to blame God? Our world is one that, you know, nobody ever talks about God until something bad happens, and then all of a sudden it's God's fault for what happened. You're the one who is to blame, and we do it in our individual lives. We love to blame God for the messes that we create in our life. Like, God, the reason I'm sinning like this is because that's how you made me. Or God, why did you even put that before me? You knew I wasn't going to be able to handle it. Why did you even allow that to happen? Or God, if you really love me, you would have never allowed that to happen. We love to blame God. So Adam blames Eve, and he blames God, and then Who does Eve blame? The serpent. He's the one who deceived me. Poor serpent didn't have anybody to blame. He just took the brunt of it. But let me ask you this. Who was to blame for Eve's sin? Eve. Who was to blame for Adam's sin? Now don't answer this one. Who's to blame for your sin? You are. Who's to blame for my sin? I am. You know what? We need to quit passing the blame. And we love to do that today. Everybody, there's always got to be somebody to blame for anything that happens. We like to blame our parents. We like to blame blame our upbringing, the circumstances, our environment that we're in that has caused us to be like who we are. No, please hear me here. Take responsibility for who you are and what you do. Quit the blame game. And the last thing that sin brought 
were consequences. The serpent was now going to crawl on his belly. Undoubtedly, the serpent had legs before this. Doesn't have any more. He's going to be in the dirt the rest of his life. There's going to be enmity between him and, the, and, and, and man. And then woman, she's going to have pain in childbearing. You know what? I, I have a feeling that when a, you ladies get up into heaven, you're going to look for Eve and you're going to slap her. It's her fault. There is pain in childbearing. But you, do you see the other one? Your husband will rule over you. That's part of the fall. Then the man. He's going to work, but it's not going to be as easy. It's not going to be a joy any longer. There's going to be toil. There's going to be strife. There's going to be all kinds of things happening that it just never seems to work out. And it's funny how, how men, we try to, to build our self-respect and self-esteem on what we do. And, and so often our work is so hard and we feel like a failure and, and, and then we don't feel good about who we are. It's funny how all this works. There are consequences to sin. Folks, all of the brokenness in the world and in our individual lives started right here with Adam and Eve. Because they fell from God and fell into sin, they have now passed on their sin nature to every one of us. But what I love about the story, and I wish we had more time to get into it, God was already ready and he already sets in motion a plan of redemption, of restoration, and forgiveness, even the moment they fail. Did you notice what it said here? He said, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ on the cross. Satan thought he won. He nipped at his heel. He bit his heel. And Jesus died on the cross. But then he rose again. We sung about it today. And he was going to crush Satan because he rose from the dead. And the rest of the Bible from this moment on is about God's plan to redeem us and restore us. And my encouragement to you is turn to him today. Satan's desire with sin is is to bring brokenness into your life. It's to bring pain. So don't buy into his lies. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you that you created us in perfection. And God, thank you that through Jesus Christ and his shed blood, that perfection can come back. Not that we will be perfect here, but we will one day. And Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for crushing Satan on the cross and in the resurrection, the empty tomb. Thank you for what you've done for us. But God, we stand before you fallen. We stand and we sit before you as people who sin and we choose to sin. It's nobody else's fault. It's our fault. We choose to do it. God, please help us to quit listening to the lies of Satan that make us think that that sin that we're doing is really giving us life when really what it's doing is bringing brokenness and it's killing something in our life. Lord, you don't tell us not to sin because you want to take our fun away. You tell us not to sin because you don't want us to be broken people. And the more we sin, the greater the brokenness comes. So, Lord, would you help us? We can't do it on our own. Lord, help us to overcome those sins in our life through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to submit and obey and give our all to you. Father, thank you again that you set in motion a plan from the very fall of man. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. This is our time of invitation. Maybe something's gone on in your week and you just need to pray about it. That's what the altar is for. Maybe you even want to grab the hand of your spouse or have somebody else come with you and say, would you come down in the front and pray with me? Others of you, maybe you need to make a decision.
Maybe you've never received Jesus Christ. The altar is open. Grady and I will be down here to receive you, and we can tell you about a relationship with Jesus Christ that you can have that will change your life, that will bring forgiveness into your heart. Whatever you need to do, the altar is open for you. As we sing, you come. I just kind of want to reiterate a little bit of what Pastor Cannon said. Uh, this week I had been talking with uh, one of my friends about, uh, you know, that there's... You can get up on stage and, and just like do music, but uh, there's there's a little bit of a difference between music and worship. And we got to talking about how you know music is pretty much just like a performance, and and worship is like an offering. So when we come in here and uh, and we really haven't like prepared our hearts to come in and um, to worship. We're really just doing music. You're just coming in here and you're reading what's on the screen. Words are coming out of your mouth, but you're really not giving everything that you have to God. And um, and it it's kind of the same same for me as it is for everybody else, but. I want everybody to to be in the spirit of worship right now and not just being able to perform music. I want everybody to truly bring everything that they have to God right now and um, and actually worship. So with that being said, um, the song we're going to sing is called I Surrender.
pray that that would be the attitude of our heart that we would surrender everything that we have and all that we are to him so as we close this morning let's go with god and let's go to share him with others as well Preston. god we love you so much and just thank you for this morning thank you for um, your forgiveness that you offer us god where we can come and surrender and confess and find healing um, your word is truth we see it even at the beginning, Lord, in the garden, um, and we crave to be reconciled with you, God. We want to be uh, walking in truth with you, Father. Um, just lead our church. Thank you for our church, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.